Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proofs to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo, we're going to be here with Frank Green. Frank is the guy from the lab. That's right. This is Seba Chrome Frank, Ilfa Chrome, whatever you want to call it. Frank is the man when it comes to printing Ilfa Chrome, Seba Chrome, positive prints. This is unbelievable work. We're going to talk to Frank today about himself, how he does this process, what it's like, and all these cool things going on with the lab. Frank, how you doing today? Really good. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to have you on the program to talk about this unbelievable printing that you're up to. You have the lab in Burbank, California, and you specialize in Cibachrome, Ilfachrome, basically printing using the positive process. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. So Frank, tell me about the lab. Tell me about what you guys do. Give me a little overview here, and then we'll dig in deeper. I have been printing for a long time, 30 years. Started out printing more for the studios, doing album covers. Then the prints were scanned, and that became the artwork. Then I did a lot of movie poster work, and there again, they were scanned. That is not kind of my idea of a good time, and I started concentrating more on the fine art aspects, especially dealing with conceptual photographers, who basically are artists and not necessarily photographers, but they use photography as their medium. That's been pretty much the thrust of the business in the past 20 years. So let's do an overview here of what a SIBA print is so people know what this is in comparison to a traditional print, so forth and so on. Well, it's a direct positive print. In other words, so you're printing from a positive. You can print digitally, too, if you want. I don't. You take your positive, your transparency, and it can be whatever size, 8 by 10 to an 8 millimeter film clip, whatever expose the paper, and everything is done in the dark, of course. It goes through the processor. The processor that I have is about 55 inches wide, and it's probably about maybe 90 inches long. 
it goes through the developer first. After it comes out of the developer, it looks like a negative, essentially. Then goes through the wash, rinses off the excess chemistry. Then it goes into the bleach, and the bleach, it's called a dye destruction. So the bleach just sort of washes away all the excess silver, and at that point, the color is exposed. When it comes out of the bleach, it goes into another wash, then it goes into a fix, and essentially, once it comes out of the bleach, that's the final print, so to speak, but it still needs to be fixed. The difference with SIBA is the dye is in the paper, as opposed to being coupled with a chromogenic process. The dye that's used in the SIBA paper is an azo dye. It's manufactured by SIBA Geige which is a pharmaceutical company in Switzerland. The equivalent would be like Lilly in the United States or something. It's a very, very high-grade dye and very fade-resistant. That's kind of like the overview of the print itself. It tends to be a lot more saturated, and blacks are a lot blacker. It's a very glossy finish, and the paper itself is quite thick. It actually has nine layers. If you bend it, that's it. It's history. It retains. It's got this memory. It's significantly different than a chromogenic print in appearance, and I think also the way it reacts to film. I guess I should say, the reason people get a Sivachrome is it is the closest you can get to replicating your original film. There's no interneg, there's no scan, and unless you choose to do it that way. So it's a direct process. So it's a very clean, beautiful product. Sivachrome is an incredible thing. It's been around probably since the early 60s, and it's all manufactured in Switzerland. The chemistry of the paper, the Swiss don't change things. It's kind of like they sort of nailed their process probably back in the 80s, and I don't really think that they aspire to make it better, but they maintain a very, very high level quality. Like, very rarely is there a defect in any of the material. And usually, people who are really, really traditional photographers, people that use film, that would be a typical kind of clientele. Somebody that doesn't want to deal with a computer or they're more into retro ways. I could do anything from a 4x5 on up to 50 inch by 100 inches, the maximum that I could do. A typical size that I do would be 30 by 40, 50 by 60. That's kind of a more normal size. A lot of that stuff goes to museums. I'm working on a job right now that's going to the Art Institute in Chicago and it consists of 12 different panels that are butted up against each other. They're 35 feet long and they're 6 feet high. These are mounted on a material called dye bond, which is aluminum, and there's a glossy laminate that's put over it. Once before in 94, I printed the same job and it had gone to the Pompidou in Paris and then it ended up in Japan. Now I'm doing the last three of the edition, and the photographer is Lewis Balls. So all the prints that you're doing, even these gigantic ones, are all done optically. This is where you start off with a piece of chrome, a positive, uh-huh. and optically transmit this on the material. Correct. The difference now is that it used to be, in the olden days, if somebody had a 35 millimeter and they wanted to do a large print, it had to be dupe. And dupe transparencies are just like from the devil. They're terrible. But there wasn't an alternative. Now I do a lot of scanning where I'll have the transparency drum scanned, usually about 400 megabytes, and then it's digitally output to either an 8x10 trans or a 4x5. And sort of the name for that would be an LVT. I do a lot of that. If somebody has a digital file, they can also output it directly to the film. And I do a lot of that too. So I don't traditionally then have to actually shoot a chrome. I can shoot a color neg or really anything. And if it's scanned and brought into a digital environment, then I can give the file to you and you do an LTV to like an 8x10 piece of chrome. And then you can print from that. Yeah, you could take a negative, a black and white negative. You could scan it in grayscale and output it in a positive way to an 8x10 transparency. And you'd have a cheaper version of what David Wood does. But anything that can be scanned or that is a digital file can be output that way. The file has to be of a certain size. Like if you have a two megabyte file, it's too small really to do anything with. But if it's at least, say, five megs, then you get really good results. So ideally, it is best to have the original positive. With a 35 millimeter format, how big can you print before you need to actually go up to a bigger positive? 
It depends what your standards are. Now, if you are strictly by the book, I think that 16 by 20 is sort of the ideal format for that. But that's not to say you can't go bigger. I mean, I do a lot of 20 by 30 prints because it's proportionate to the 35 and occasionally 35 to 30 by 40. The problem is reciprocity because the transparency is so small and the enlargement is so big that your exposures can be half an hour. It's crazy. Wow. I know. I could go out to lunch and leave the enlarger on. So if it's just a straight exposure you're dealing with, okay, well, I'll do something else. I have a lot of enlargers. But if you need to lighten something or darken something, so if your exposure is a half an hour and you need to lighten something, that would mean you'd have to stand there for half an hour burning it in, which could get really old. You could get really old doing it. <laughs> and I guess that's the thing that you have to make some of these contrast masks when you well, do a Well, the contrast mask is if the dynamic range is too great on the transparency. For instance, somebody's got Fuji Velvia, and it's 50 ASA, and maybe it's late in the afternoon and they're at the beach. You've got this really white sand, and shadows are all over the place. The shadows are too deep, and highlights are too hot. And the only thing you can do is you can scan it and kind of fix it, but that's kind of the other way. You can do a contrast mask, which is taking the transparency, the positive, and contacting it with a piece of black and white. I use FP4 film and putting a diffuser between the two and exposing it and then hand processing it. And what you end up with is a piece of film that is in register with the original and there's density in the highlight areas and the shadow areas are open. So you're essentially dodging and burning with a piece of film. Right. Much better than standing there doing it by hand. It is. Some of the problems with that is I put everything between glass so if you have a holder, the holder has four surfaces, top, bottom, all four surfaces. Then you've got the mask, that's another two surfaces, and then you've got the film, that's another two surfaces. So that's eight surfaces of glass that you have to deal with as far as dust or Newton rings or any of that kind of stuff. And that's where it sort of gets a little more complicated. So typically, Frank, what type of customers looking for a Cibachrome, Ilfochrome print from you guys compared to a traditional C print for a collar neg or some digital output? Typically, people that are really unhappy with what they get at their local photo store, their local lab, they'll get a digital print, and almost everything is digital prints nowadays. And it's usually Fuji or whatever the lab is using. And not to generalize, but a lot of times it comes out looking very uninspired and flat. And they're really unhappy with that. They want it to look like how it looks on the screen in their computer. They want this kind of glowing, translucent quality with these rich colors. That's a typical person. It's a job I'm doing right now from a guy from Minneapolis. And I've done stuff for him before. He's a scuba diver. Him and his wife were diving, and they had gone training where you swim with the sharks, but you're not protected at all. It's the sort of attitude that you become non-threatening. Well, he's got a digital picture of this 20-foot shark kind of encircling him as he's taking a picture. He sent me the file, so what I do is consult with him. It's a digital file, so I can kind of tweak it a bit, and I'm going to output an 8x10 transparency. And then with that print, a 20 by 30 print, mount it, and he adds it to his collection. He's got a number of Cebus already that he's collected over the years. That's a kind of a typical scenario as far as a non-professional use. So I guess trying to explain this is difficult because we're not showing this visually, but people can expect from this type of print something that would be even more color and more vibrance, and it would pop even more than if you did a traditional C print even on glossy paper then. Without a question. The other big deal with the SIBA, which for some reason doesn't get mentioned, is it's the most archival of the color photographic processes. I have SIBAs here that are 30 years old that look brand new. I have a 30 by 40 print of James Taylor when he had a full head of hair, and it looks like I printed it yesterday. I had an English photographer bring some prints in that he had had printed in London back in the 60s. And other than the fact that they're kind of trashed, they look the same. They haven't faded. They're very archival. The appearance is significantly different than a chromogenic print, yes. Let's chat here briefly about black and white. 
I know that our good buddy Dave Wood at DR5 can do this reversal process and supply unbelievably beautiful black and white chrome. Mm-hmm. You can actually print from a DR5 chrome. Mm-hmm. And even though these are color dyed prints, the black and white process still looks pretty good. It looks fantastic. His particular process, because they're so neutral, they yield really great, great results. When you take a black and white image and expose it to color paper, it doesn't look like a traditional black and white print. It can't. It's impossible. But it takes on a quality of its own. He has one process where there's a slight sepia to it, and it's duplicated perfectly on the sepia. You end up having this sort of a very rich gold tone colored image. There was a photographer with a picture of, I think it's called Black Canyon. And I did a 30 by 40 print of that. And he shot it with, I think it was a 6 by 7 centimeter. And it's so amazingly sharp. And you can just see every little crevice. And it ends up being this really beautiful charcoal sort of color. Very nice. That's great to see that you can actually do the black and white because a lot of people love traditional black and white print. And like I said, it's hard to explain, but when you see a SEBA print, it is amazing. People, they'll be in airports or something or in Vegas and they'll see a SEBA print. I have an Indian woman, not that it matters whether she's Indian or not, but she is Indian, from New Jersey who was in an airport and she saw a SEBA print and she came up with this idea. She wanted two very large prints done on SEBA chrome and then mounted and then shipped to her place back east. So she found two images. One was BAM, or Lake Louise. The other, I don't remember, I think it was a poppy field or something. She rented the images. And the company, Bauhaus, who does my digital work, they could go to the site of the photo vendor, so to speak, and downloaded these files. The files were like maybe 600 megabytes, and then output transparencies, And then I printed these huge prints for this woman. But she came to me just because that's what she wanted. She wanted it to look very lush. I'm doing an interesting job now. There's a photographer, an English guy, the same guy that had brought the Sebas in. He shot Jimi Hendrix in 1967 in London in his studio. At that time, Jimi Hendrix was unknown in the United States, pretty much, and kind of known in England. He did this great studio shot, did it with a Hasselblad, and lost the film. So this is 1967 now, and he found the film in January of 2010, this year. It was at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of a pile of film in his storage closet in a warehouse. So he scanned this image that had deteriorated over the years and then output it to an 8x10 trans, and we have been working on that for about the past maybe month and a half, just fine-tuning it. It's really great. It's just amazing. It's sort of like channeling a dead musician. (laughs) It's really fun. One of the portraits that's going to go into the portrait gallery in London, I believe his goal is to sell another one on Christie's and just sort of do stuff with it. But amazing image, but it is just stunning. And so I'm printing it life-size, the headshot. Wow. What do you find, Frank, film-wise is the best to shoot if you're going to shoot a chrome? And you want to do this completely optically, no digital involvement, 100% analog straight through. What's the best? Provia. Provia? Yeah. Provia, to me, translates the best to the Alpha Chrome. The 100, I don't care for. The 50 is good, but it tends to be a little garish. But that's okay, too. Provia is just a little easier. The contrast is a little bit softer. It's more subtle. So based off of what it costs to have this stuff done, because it's basically, I'm sure, very similar making an 8 by 10 than it is doing a 16 by 20 you're better off printing big with this process than... Alpha Chrome does better with a larger image, like a 5 by 7 print or an 8 by 10 print. The shadow areas, even if you mask, they tend to kind of maybe get a little too saturated. Sort of like driving a car that's got a big engine and you're going 25 miles an hour. It doesn't really want to go 25 miles an hour. It kind of wants to breathe. I personally recommend at least an 11 by 14 print. I can do any size, but I think you get better results with a little bit larger size print. And to me, the most important thing is if you're doing a print for somebody, I just always assume that people's attention span is very short. If you show somebody a 4 by 5 inch print, they're going to look at it for about a second. If you show them a 16 by 20 print, They might look at it for a second, but the amount of information that's taken in is so much greater. And you really communicate the idea so much quicker and effectively, I think. 
Do you think that if people are doing uh, limited edition runs or one-off prints that are for sale that the Sivachrome, Ilfachrome process is going to be worthy of a higher price? Absolutely. Yeah? There is a client of mine in New York, and she does editions of six. The average price of her prints are between, say, 10000 and 20000 And then in the aftermarket, in other words, when they're resold, they tend to climb up. If you offer somebody an Ilfachrome print and you offer them a price tag that's that high, you don't have anything to worry about. You've done your work. You're giving them the best print that's going to last the longest that you can possibly do. It's easy. What's the best way for a photographer to work with you guys, to have sample stuff done, to be able to offer these type of prints to their clients? And I'm sure these probably come out stunning as well with formal bridal portraits and all kinds of applications. Actually, bridal photography, there's the big question of economics. That's a key issue. People are much more aware and savvy of what they can do for less money. I think that a lot of bridal photographers traditionally have their images printed on C prints, like in packages, because they can do them so much cheaper and make their profit in the secondary reselling them. Sure. If you print them on SEBA, number one, the SEBA is really sharp. If you're doing portraits of people, unless you really want the portrait to be sharp, it's not that flattering. So as a result of that, I've done wedding stuff, but very rarely, because people really want something kind of soft and moody, and SEBA's not the thing. So really, it's probably not applicable to any real portraiture. It's more of a still life or landscape type process. It depends on what you're communicating with the portraits. Say, if you're taking a picture of an old Navajo woman who's maybe 90 years old and she's spent her life out on the plains, now you can get this fantastic reproduction with this beautiful golden brown complexion and the lines that are etched in her face. But if you're showing a picture of Lindsay Lohan, it's a different story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you understand what I'm saying? It depends on your style. So I guess really, if you break it down, most of your work is probably still life and landscape or 90% landscape. I would say 50% landscape and the other 50% is fine art. And I was referring to the conceptual photographers. That's very common. I have a lot of people like that or documentation. And it's work that's intended to go into a gallery or a museum. Do you find you have a lot of conceptual artists that are doing digital work and then they output to a piece of chrome and then you print them? No, usually they shoot film, and the thing with photography is it went through this big metamorphosis, I think maybe it probably started 10 years ago, and kind of peaked like maybe two years ago or something, and everybody's got a digital camera. And what I've noticed now is everybody's got an iPhone. The iPhone has replaced the camera, and they're just emailing things. So there's this large market of people that used to actually photograph and actually make prints while well, they've moved on. And that's changed the picture quite a bit. Do you find that if you were going to shoot for a SEBA print that I would have better luck shooting color neg and then doing a digital to a LTV to chrome and then printing it or just shooting straight chrome to start with? Straight chrome. Absolutely. Yeah. The problem with the negative is that it has so much latitude, you have to scan it anyway, but it doesn't scan as well as a transparency or a reflective piece, like an 8x10 print or something. I think it's fairly common for people to shoot transparency and then scan and then go to digital print too. Do you find that you have more latitude in a SEBA print than you do in a piece of traditional chrome, or is it very similar? I would say that the latitude is very similar to chrome film. In other words, if you have a negative, you can always just sort of give it a little bit more exposure or give it a little bit less exposure. SEBA doesn't work that way. It has to be spot on, and it's not forgiving, exactly the same way chrome film is. The difference between chrome film is it's transmitted light, so you're looking at it and you're seeing light coming through the shadows, whereas the SEBA chrome is reflected. The light's reflecting off the surface of the print. So it's actually two different ways of looking at it. It is there equally critical, but that's what I'm paid for. Well, exactly. And I think you've been doing this so long that there's nobody that's going to print a better SEBA print than you. So you can make these decisions and pull the stuff off that other people couldn't. 
I don't like to take credit for inventing the bread or anything like that. Right. To me, three-fourths of it is communication with the client and getting from them what they are trying to communicate with the picture. What do they really want? The communication is the really key part. You can't assume that you know everything. Frank, have you ever done a comparison of, let's say, you took an optical piece of chrome and printed it versus the same image that's been scanned or maybe a color neg or something that's been brought in there, the same thing? A comparison between mm-hmm. a true optical and a digital optical. You know, I've done dye transfer where the same image is done on a dye transfer and a SIVA. I've done the same image done on a Fujiflex and then done on a SIVA. The Fujiflex, let's see, that actually was done digitally, but there was a lot of text that was in that particular picture that I'm thinking about. No, I can't say as I really have done like an A and B. I've printed a lot of things that have text in it, and when you have text, that pretty much tells you if your print is really sharp or not. There is a client of mine in Chicago who puts books on microfiche. So he put Moby Dick, which is a very large book, on a piece of four by six microfiche. He put the entire book on it. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) It was done in Germany, the microfiche was output. The type is so small on the microfiche that you have to look at it with like a 30 power loop. And he did digital prints with those, and he was very unhappy. I never saw the digital prints. He was very unhappy. He didn't feel they were sharp enough. And I have done a number of contact as well as optical prints for him, and they turned out great. But to answer your question, I have not specifically had ordered a digital print and then printed a SIVA from it. I just wonder because there's so many people now that are still shooting analog capture, but everything is scanned and then goes into a digital environment. And I was just wondering what you get as an output on an LTV comparative to what you'd have on a direct scan and how that sort of works out. LTT, first of all, it's output with the same machine that's used to output the print. It's only it's a smaller version. It's a light jet. And if you have a good file, like I was saying, that usually the formula I use is I do drum scans at 400 megs. It's redundant to do anything bigger. And the LVT, it literally looks better than the original. And you couldn't make it any sharper. It would be impossible. The problem is sometimes it gets too sharp, and you're kind of working against yourself. But I'm not saying that outputting to the LVT is the answer to doing things. I'm just saying that that's what I require for me to do my end of the process. I guess really the people that could put this in comparison, that a SIBA print was basically like having something that's at least 300 DPI if you were talking digital. I think it's higher than that. Wow. I would think so. It's all relative to what the original image is and, of course, your optics. I use just Apple lenses and I usually stop halfway down. The only time where there's probably a difference is if I'm doing something really big. Like, say, if I was doing a 100-inch print from a 4x5 transparency, I would say that that could be problematic and that a digital output would probably be better just because of the sheer logistics of it. So, Frank, tell me, where can people view a print? Do you have sample, something that they can get from you to look at things? And how would they actually get involved in this process to get true traditional analog print with an analog capture and make this tradition real? I have a website, which is pretty accessible. I always encourage people to either email me or to call me. And a lot of times I'll talk to people and there'll be these huge lags. There could be two years that go by before I see anything. That's the easiest way to sort of get involved. If you want to see something I've done, I can refer you to different galleries, but you would have to be in New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco or something. And if you're in Paducah, Kentucky, that might not be a practical thing. Is there a sample print? Somebody can call you up and say, hey, send me a sample. Here's the money, whatever. I can send somebody a sample print if that's what they wanted. I mean, I have sample prints. I used to advertise in Shutterbug before they downsized it. And when I advertised in there, I would get a lot of requests for people who would want a sample print and they want a price list. And then when they downsized, it was like everything downsized, including the size of the ads. So I just went online, and I've had much better. But if somebody wants a sample, they could just ask, and I'll send it to them. Cool. So, Frank, tell me website where they can see this information, the pricing. There's a statement from you, the other stuff. Where do mm-hmm. they go? 
lab dash ciba c-i-b-a dot com very easy frank i really appreciate you joining us today to explain this process it is an unbelievable process that i think people should really look at it's a completely viable option to have them shoot chrome or do a dr wood dr5 black and white and actually experiment with this and even just having a few sample prints made is not going to break the bank You can actually see this. And I think once people hold their own photo in their hand done on the SIBA process, it's going to blow their mind. I would agree. If people have a number of images that they want prints made out of, but they're leery. Here's this guy in Los Angeles, and I'm in North Carolina. And do I want to just send him and just take it for granted that he's going to do a good job? I tell him, order one print and send the most difficult one and just go from there. But as I said a number of times, is communication is the key to working with artists. This is great stuff. And again, Frank, I really appreciate it taking okay. the time to chat with us. And we look forward to talking about this topic in more depth later on. All right. It's a lot of information to digest. And a lot of times it's sort of a leap of faith, but it's a leap worth taking, I think. It is. It's like the first time you send some black and white neg to DR5. Right. And when you get it back, it's like, whoa. Why didn't I do this earlier? Exactly. And I think it's the same with your gig. It's just an incredible process. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult technical process. So people that are home darkroom hobbyists, this is not something you want to just try to go pull off. You can buy home kits to do it yourself. If you're a masochist, go for it. (laughs) Right. It'd be like, well, I have some extra dye transfer stuff laying around. So let's go try to make a few prints. Yeah, people do it all the time, and I get calls quite frequently where people are inquiring about the chemistry, and they want to know if they can buy the chemistry from me. I'm always amazed. I have a processor, and I take care of it, and I put replenishing chemistry in it, but I'm not actually dipping my hands in the chemistry. So, But black and white's one thing, and all of a sudden the image comes up, and you're standing there in the red light. But when you open the tube, and all of a sudden you pull out this color print that's just amazingly sharp and vibrant, It's a very rewarding thing. Yeah, but there's some things that are just better left to professionals. No, I agree. Frank, again, great stuff, buddy. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Well, there you go. Frank Green. What a cool guy. You ought to see his work. It's unbelievable. You need to check out his website. This is a really outstanding process. Very few people practice this in the world anymore. This is a chance to get an unbelievable image from an unbelievable piece of chrome. DR5 black and white chrome, traditional Fuji, Kodak. These are beautiful prints, and Frank can make this stuff up. You definitely check out his website. This is fabulous work carrying on this unbelievable process. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film, and, of course, fine-quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, Worldwide Publicity, Strategic Promotion, Social Media Marketing, and Business Development over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country, richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at dr5.com. Upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. And, of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at APUG.org and our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, over at EastmanHouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shippard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.